and a lot of people get quite surprised when people like me get you know excited about toys and the toy debate and think oh you know it's just a bit of harmless fun toys are a very very powerful early training opportunity for very flexible plastic brains Uy, en nano charlas en este episodio, Gina Ripon, neurocientífica británica, académica de neuroimagen cognitiva de la Universidad de Easton, e invitada especial al Congreso Futuro 2022, como parte de la conferencia digitalizada Hackear lo Binario, nos explicará que no existen diferencias a nivel cerebral entre hombres y mujeres y cómo las costumbres sociales pueden moldear nuestro cerebro. A finales del siglo XVIII surgió la idea de que como los hombres y las mujeres tenían cuerpos, habilidades y roles diferentes, también tendrían cerebros diferentes. Gina Ripon se especializó en este tipo de investigaciones y llegó a la conclusión de que no era así y que este juicio era solo un mito repetido durante décadas. Pero, ¿qué implica que no existan diferencias entre el cerebro femenino y masculino respecto al comportamiento humano? Cuando digo que no hay diferencia entre los brains of males and the brains of females, I, I would say that I believe every brain is different from every other brain. So in fact, I'm sure my brain is different from your brain, not necessarily because you're a male and I'm a female, but because um, we will have had different experiences in life, etc. And I think that's, that's the big issue associated with understanding what we mean when we talk about male and female brains. And the book that I've written was called The Gendered Brain, because I believe that what goes on outside the brain in the world, stereotypes, attitudes, experiences, can in fact change the brain in particular ways and could mold a brain along feminized and masculinized lines, if you like. But the basis of the original argument is that there was some kind of fixed difference um, between the brains from men and the brains from women. And from that sex difference, um, if, from that brain difference ex extended all into behavior and roles in society, etc. So there was a very firm biological argument. This brain is different from that brain and, and, and very determined that different meant all male, male brains are like this and all female brains are like that. And what I'm saying is that science does not support that. And in the 21st century, now we can look at intact living human brains in intact living humans, which was not the case when all these theories were being generated, we have to backtrack on this assumption that you could somehow sex the human brain. And therefore, that provided support for beliefs in differences in behavior, beliefs in differences in abilities, beliefs in people having one kind of role in society or another. Um, so I think that's, that's basically what I mean when I say um, There's no such thing as a female brain, to sum it up briefly. Bajo la premisa de que no existen diferencias físicas entre los cerebros de un hombre y una mujer, todas las características relacionadas con habilidades cognitivas, personalidades y temperamento no tendrían un origen biológico, sino más bien cultural. En este sentido, ¿Esto significa que tampoco existe una mente masculina o femenina? What happens is that we now know that the brain is affected a lot by external influences such as attitude and expectations. So if, you know, a child arrives in the world and is greeted with what I call the pink and blue tsunami of 21st century coding of the difference between males and females, then they'll be treated differently. Um, They will become to behave differently. They will uh, interpret the world around them differently. So you could say there is a, a female mind and a male mind, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're looking at a one-way result of brains being different. Um, it's a very entangled process. What happens outside the brain changes the brain and the brain will therefore interact with the outside world in a different way. But talking about differences between brains and minds, of course, is trying at this point to talk about centuries of, of philosophy, which we probably haven't got time for. <laughs> Hasta el siglo XXI se sostenía en relación al cerebro que la biología era el destino, que el cerebro se desarrollaba hasta cierto momento de nuestra vida 
y luego, ya de adultos, este órgano permanecía inalterado, excepto por factores como la herencia genética y las hormonas. Sin embargo, en los últimos 30 años se ha descubierto que nuestros cerebros son plásticos y maleables. Pero, ¿bajo qué condiciones el cerebro puede cambiar o evolucionar? Well, I think that's that discovery of that characteristic of the human brain. Um, the fact that it's plastic throughout our lives is the key issue. That's something new. We, if you had been a medical student about 40 years ago, you would have been taught that um, a baby is born with all the adult number of nerve cells it's ever going to have. You know, the brain gets bigger because the connections between these cells uh, increase, etc. But there was this idea that there was some kind of fixed difference between brains. Um, and it's, you know, people talk about hardwired, you know, in, in, in that particular sense. And we knew that the brain of a developing baby was fairly flexible. Um, and if it was deprived of certain experiences, um, then you could actually see that within the brain. But they thought there was a fixed endpoint. You know, when your brain stopped growing, that was the brain you were ever going to have. And that was the brain that was going to carry you through the rest of your life, or at least until you got old and bits of your brain started disappearing. Uh, but now we know that the kind of experiences we have, the things that we learn, um, can change the brain. And also attitudes. So the brain will process information differently depending on how the problem um, is presented. So we know our brains are also responsive um, to what's going on outside um, in, in, in our world. And that's throughout our lives. So that actually, again, puts the lie to this idea that there is some kind of fixed difference between male and female brains. What we're looking at when we look at the way in which people behave differently is the result of lifelong exposure to, to different experiences. Uno de los conceptos que desarrolla Gina Ripón en sus investigaciones es el de cerebro social y señala que las reglas externas de la sociedad y el contexto social en el que vive una persona influyen cómo funciona su cerebro. En el caso de los niños, ¿cómo los juguetes que se les entregan pueden moldear sus cerebros? People get quite surprised when people like me get, you know, excited about toys and the toy debate and think, oh, you know, it's just a bit of harmless fun. Toys are a very, very powerful early training opportunity for very flexible plastic brains. So if one group of babies, young children are exposed to amazing construction toys, which give you experience of how different objects fit together or the relationship between different objects, the brains, the, the kind of spatial training that that offers will result in a greater ability in that area, which will then further down the line mean that you might enjoy science type um, education more, you might go into a scientific career. Whereas if there's another sort of toy, which is much, much more to do with nurturing and, and social interaction, that will channel that kind of brain down a different uh, route. And, um, and that will result in individuals who feel more comfortable with, with, with those kind of activities. So toys, toys are really, really important. And not giving one group of children or not giving all children experience of all toys uh, is something that, that we should really be fighting for. Los estereotipos de género también se presentan en el sistema escolar y muchos de ellos permanecen cuando los estudiantes ya son adultos. Por ejemplo, respecto a habilidades en materia como matemáticas o deporte, ¿qué pueden hacer las escuelas para potenciar las capacidades de las mujeres en áreas como la ciencia? I mean, my particular area of interest, because I actually think it's the most important area to be looking at, is early years education. Um, because those are the years when children are what I've called questing gender detectives. They, you know, they, they know there are differences and they start to realize the differences are valued differently. And what does that mean for them? You know, and if you've got six year old girls saying, uh, I can't play that game because it's only for really, really clever people and girls can't be really, really clever or, you know, maths is a boy thing kind of thing. And clearly that's a really important area to challenge and to, to really look at the effect of, of gender stereotyping in, in the early years. So I think that's, um, that's an area that I think is really important.
Considerando la brecha que existe en el propio mundo de la ciencia respecto a la igualdad de género, ¿existe debate al interior de la comunidad científica sobre cómo abordar estas investigaciones? Sometimes people forget, particularly even, I have to say, within the science communities, why are we asking this question? Are we interested in the fact that there's clear evidence of um, epidemiological differences, for example, in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease? So you've got brain-based diseases, Alzheimer's, appears to be more common in females, Parkinson's more common in males. So you would ask the question to um, address that particular issue. Or you might be interested in mental health issues, for example, much higher incidence of depression and anxiety and eating disorders in females um, and personality disorders and, and high suicide rates in, in young males, etc. Or are you just interested in, you know, what could somebody's brain tell us about the skills they have, the personalities they have, whether or not this would make them appropriate leadership material or etc. So, so science sometimes forgets that we're not just asking, is there a male or a female brain? There is a reason for asking that question. And some scientists will say, if you deny that there are sex differences, and sex difference denier is one of the more polite terms I've been called over the years, Um, then you're undermining, um, you know, medical research ca um, uh, crusade to, to, to cure Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, etc. Um, so sometimes the um, there, there is a, a you know a, a tension uh, within science about saying we don't think that there are differences between male and female brains. And somebody you know whose whole career is actually looking for where these differences might be in order to solve a particular problem, understandably feels uh, challenged <laughs> um, and will respond appropriately. But there are also others who, um, it's an easy question to ask. You know, you've got a huge amount of data from a large number of people. You can just say, well, let's have a look at the difference between the male participants and the female participants. You might find some differences and you interpret them in terms of the existing Uh, beliefs, if you like. Um, and so this kind of neurosexist approach, is, as it has been termed, um, is challenging. If you are trying to say this is really important research, we need to do it properly, but we need to acknowledge other factors besides sex. Um, so it's not universally positively received. <laughs> Arguments are ongoing. <laughs> Vivimos en un mundo dividido en función del género en el que constantemente recibimos mensajes sobre cómo nuestro género determina las aptitudes y las preferencias, desde los juguetes y los colores hasta los estudios y los sueldos, al comprobar con datos de la neurociencia lo contrario. ¿Qué impacto en la sociedad deberían tener este tipo de investigaciones? Um, well, I think in particular we're talking about a political dimension. I mean, one of the things, uh, one of the reasons that we're interested in this question, this isn't just an anatomical question about hunt the a particular bit of the brain that makes the brain male or the bit of the brain which makes the brain female. It's actually, what does, what does having different kinds of brain mean to people? And so we look at gender gaps in society. And of course, there's a huge political dimension to that, uh, whether or not these are given and that we should, you know, uh, say, let boys be boys or um, vive la différence or, or whatever phrase you want to use. If politically you're going to say there needs to be policy to address these issues, you need to say, do these gaps come from some kind of biological difference? In which case, what should we do about it? Should we do anything about it? And you certainly know within science, there has been sort of quite explosive political outbursts from male scientists saying that, you know, particular branches of science shouldn't be wasting their time uh, spending their money on education girls. To, to be scientists, which is a pretty political statement. Um, but also educational policy as well, because if you're uh, looking at training, you know, the next generation, you need to understand what it is or how people learn, what it is that affects uh, their acquisition of skills or their use of skills. And within organizations, what it is that keeps some people within those organizations and succeeds, and what drives other people out of those organizations, even though on paper they look equally competent. So there is a definite political 
dimension. And, you know, if you wanted to go even more extreme, you could talk about power differentials and, and the belief that um, only men are suited to uh, be leaders of great political parties or countries or whatever. Um, and occasionally there are females, but they have the exception that proves the rule, etc.